Thank you so much. Um, I'd start with uh, the follow on Jeff's uh, practice. I'll start with four numbers. Night, well, four, it's more than four digits, but four numbers. 1982, 140, 2, and 1. Anybody know what those are? 1982 was the year that Warren Buffett spoke to our class at Sanford Business School and had an indelible, placed an indelible mark in my own uh, career and my own thinking about investing. 140 would have most likely been the millions of dollars that he was then worth. Because I think at the time the company had a market value of about $300 million and uh, he owned 40% of it. That number, if you fast forward today, is probably 40 billion, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, two is exactly the number of ounces of single malt stock whiskey that it takes to get me to fly to London, Ontario, and meet you. <laughs> and one is the number of Mac uh, Monte Cristo number two cigars that Jeff offered in the outdoor uh, elements that you have in Toronto winter for us to smoke a cigar together. So you can see how cheap a date I am to <laughs> come all this way to address this. Um, Proud that I, and I knew that I had arrived in a, in a, in a like-minded venue when I visited Professor George at the start tonight. And I looked into his office and it was suitably disheveled <laughs> for an academic setting. But interspersed amongst the loose leaf papers were books on the, on the bookshelf that had names like valuation, how to evaluate, how to value a company. Um, and what was conspicuously missing was the books that are titled risk on and risk off, or you know, how to generate alpha, beta, delta, or gamma. And of course, that's where you're supposed to be spending your time, is on value, learning how to value companies and forgetting about the rest of the stuff. And so to see your professor's uh, uh, bookshelves filled with the right material, I thought was a, a, great, a great welcoming sign. And then the professor said that this class loves value investing, and I explored that a bit with just what it is about value investing. And, he said he, liked the dis he thinks the students like the discipline of, of the frame of reference that it gives to know when to come into an investment, when to come out. I would just make a note that I never learned to come out in my own investing career, so so many of my investings and investments I've had since the early 1980s. And I have, I've forgotten the notion of coming out, but that's, that's part of the Buffett legacy that I think um, instructs investors to have a very long-term uh, orientation. Uh, but we talked about it a little bit further, and, and it was this concept that I think I find so constantly and continuing engaging about value investing, which is it's the blend of so many of the disciplines that you'll have across the school here. It requires you to have finance, economics, accounting, strategy, marketing, and then some eye towards macro uh, factors, and all those are constantly asked of you as an investor. Uh, even in a position like those that I might have owned for the past 25 years, every day, factors that influence all those disciplines that come to you through this school arise in my decision as to whether to continue to hold and to sell. Um, uh, Professor uh, Akanaka said that there might be a course in the future called strategic macro investing, and my pledge to you as students is to encourage you to keep them so busy that he doesn't develop that class. <laughs> I, think you're, I think the idea of staying close to value is, is, is where you want to be. Now I look out at the audience here and I, I must commend you. I, I spoke at a school, smaller audience, but nonetheless uh, characterized by one aspect that's not so here, which is it was all men. And so in this class there are a lot of women and I applaud that. And I know that my own experience has been that I've trained with some extraordinarily talented women investors. So, for any of the women here who have an eye towards investing, I encourage you to pursue it um, and welcome, welcome men as well to the profession. And, and this format that you go through with investors um, who come to visit, I think is fitting because in some ways this is a trade more than a profession. Um, and those who attempt to professionalize it too much with um, the use of, of, of higher order um, academics um, run the risk of losing what you'll get from people who come here and who you might be lucky enough to um, associate with when you come out if you choose a path in investing. Which is just that as a trade, you get to learn lessons and anecdotes. Um, 
from those who have gone before you. Um, that's what I've done, and uh, and they they stand for certain things. You 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 think back over the important lessons that you learned, and usually expressed by an investor around an issue that they found particularly rewarding or not. Um, and so um, the the format of this class is is, is particularly useful from that standpoint. Uh, when I came out of uh, Stanford uh, Business and Law School, um, I had, an, had several factors that led me early on into the idea of having global investments. Um, Jeff mentioned uh, some of the numbers about uh, the career that followed um, and about the concentration of the portfolio holdings and all the rest. At the moment, at this time, uh, the, my investment portfolio is characterized by having almost 70% of our assets invested in European companies. And you can't imagine what it's like today to sit down at an investor meeting with, with any investors today who have read any headlines and have them ask you, why is it that you want so many European stocks? Haven't we established that Europe is, is going to go eventually out of business um, and the euro as a currency will break? And, and there's just so much consensus about why Europe is a, is a um, a dry hole in the investment business, and I have 60 plus, maybe 70 percent of funds invested through European companies in pursuit of opportunities that are global. I am a global investor, um, and uh, a couple of fun little uh, pictures. This um, I'm a long-term investor, and this this photograph expresses something that arose uh, in 2008, when just before the, the financial meltdown. Um, all summer long, every day you went into the market, uh, there was bad news and the markets were unraveling. My family and I went on a trip um, to Africa at the time and we went out on safari and every day we went to the safari. We'd look at animals and our guide would say, that's a horrible, dangerous animal and if you ever get separated from the group, make sure if you do that you stand still. If it attacks you, don't move and if you don't run, it won't, it won't attack you and harm you. And he said that for 25, 30 different threatening beasts. And then one day we came up on this one called the Cape, Al uh, the Cape Buffalo. And he said, that's a really nasty animal. And if ever you're separated from the group and you come upon one of those, run like hell. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the interesting story, why it resonated for me at the time is, you know, as an investor over the prior 30 years, um, whenever you'd have a market catastrophe, the lessons that investors took from that is stay the course. You know, Double down your research, try to make sure your numbers are right, but don't sell just because the markets are in disarray. Um, if you stand firm, uh, you'll be safe. And um, as I thought about the approaching beast here, I sort of thought about the markets at the same time because they were really quite different. We saved the course and the markets have recovered since, but it wasn't clear at the time and it often isn't. Uh, this slide I use is just an expression that as a very, very long-term investor, which is what I am, I have to care deeply about, about the corporate culture and, uh, and, and also what it is that um, the future will give. Um, so um, when asked about the process of value investing uh, at one of the annual meetings, Warren Buffett said, it's very, it's very simple. It's, it's simply uh, Aesop's fable. What you're really asked to do as an investor is to give up the burden hand for some in the bush. And all investing is about that process. Uh, and it's about knowing how soon the, the bush will fill with birds and how many of them. And um, as, as Warren himself said when asked uh, the question, he said, it's as simple as that and it's as complicated as that because there is nothing guaranteed about why the um, nest would necessarily fill up with, with more birds. And then this one has to do with culture and it's also referring back to Nestle, which is my, one of my top uh, holdings. Um, the head of the CFO of Nestle at one point addressed a group of investors and he used this slide. He had been the, the head of the, the Japanese uh, division for Nestle and he used this slide and he said that it, it was impressive to him because of the um, temple <coughs> zone and he said that the temple was 700 years old. Um, none of the wood in it was 700 years old but the temple was 700 years old and what it stands for is um, the need to refresh. Uh, and with companies, um, it's the same thing. If, what I look for is an enduring culture that can carry a business forward uh, for the time horizon that I have as an investor, which is, which is forever. And the, um, 
and yet the people who I invest with to begin with will no longer be there by the time um, I stop investing. But a good business will have a culture that endures. It'll be replaced, the people will be replaced, the businesses may be replaced. The nesting that we own today is vastly different than the business that we first bought in 1987. Um, when I had um, the chance to hear Mr. Buffett speak back in the early 1980s, he stressed the standard tenets of value investing, which is to try to buy a 50 cent dollar bill. You know, um, you've read The Intelligent Investor, I gather, from, from your course reading, and you know it has the idea of uh, margin of safety, um, buy a business as though it was, a, 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 buy a stock as though you're buying a piece of a business, and recognize that the market's man and depressive. Um, the 50 cent dollar mantra is the, the margin of safety that you build in by paying less than a business is worth today. But um, for our class, uh, Mr. Buffett and then the professor I studied under had a couple of extra points, which I think are the ones that really have driven my career. And one of them uh, from um, Warren was that you can't make a good deal with a bad person. And how that expresses itself in the investment business is, it's, it is in an area called agency costs. So when you invest in a public company, you are in effect giving your money over to a management team who will then invest it on behalf of your investors for um, as long as you stay invested in that business. Um, the agency cost issue arises over whether they're making investment decisions that are in your interest as the investor or in their interest as management. It turns out to be the most important issue if you do as I do adopt a very long-term minded investment approach because the ability for the investment to carry you along after you've made an investment at a 50 cent valuation is what delivers the compound. If you think about what it means to be a, um, to only buy a 50 cent dollar bill, um, I'm sure you in the audience will all know what that means in terms of a compound. If you if you close that discount in, in a year's time, you'll have doubled your money. You've had a 100% return. If it takes you seven years to close that discount, you'll only have a 10% return. And if it takes you 14 years, you'll have a 4% return, 5% return. Um, and um, that means that the only way you can profit in that style of value investing, which is to simply buy an inert pool of assets at a discount, is you have to close the discount. And so you're entirely sensitive to how quickly that happens, and, um, and it's very taxable. The alternative is to find something at a discount that has the capacity to reinvest against um, the, the future prospects and, and, and have the um, dollar bill that you pay 50 cents for up front grow over time. At that point, you're led into a much higher compound and fortunately for tax paying investors, you don't have to sell. And so um, the, uh, the other aspect of uh, the, um, value, the global value investing that I do as it relates to the Stanford experience um, of the, the, the um, notion of agency costs was just so profound. But another component in the early 1980s for me was um, by the professor, much like uh, Professor George is here, who had the investment course, said, don't be provincial. The world has um, only 4% of the population was living in America at the time, the United States, I should say. 4.4% if you include Canada. Um, and uh, we probably had 50% of the global equity values. And the idea was, um, you know, we're probably pretty well discovered values in North America, but with 95% of the rest of the world available, look elsewhere. And in 1982, that was extremely hard to do. Um, markets, and, and I, I think I first started to invest in Nestle in 1987, and to give you an idea how difficult it was, you couldn't buy common shares, you could only buy bearer shares and only through participating certificates in a currency that was extremely difficult to settle, which is the Swiss franc back then. Fast forward to today, um, you can buy common stock in Nestle. And, um, and, 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 and uh, but the difficulties back then in implementing an investment plan abroad was very high. Um, um, the investors to whom I spoke at the time were very skeptical. As Americans or as United States investors, uh, 
their, their response when I suggested that we might look abroad for, for, for opportunity was, can you trust the accounting? And how can you trust the currency? So as early as 1984, when I started down this path, the currency question I thought, um, I, I felt quite comfortable with. Much like this class here, I see that it's a very diverse um, class, probably internationally, and certainly from different backgrounds. And I had the same experience at Stanford. And um, what I learned from my international students and colleagues was that they didn't trust their home currency. If you, if the, if you talk to the folks who grew up in Spain, you know, they had money parked in England, they had some in the States, they had some in, in Brazil, um, but they didn't have the kind of supreme confidence that their currency would alone reign strong as America enjoyed in 1982. Um, when, and so I was also, as a law student, quite aware of the fact that the democracy that we enjoy south of the border has an has a Achilles heel, which is that in order to gain votes, you can get them most quickly by promising to spend money that you don't have. And over time, that's very corrosive. And we've seen that happen. Um, if you fast forward to the, um, to the 23, 25 years that I've been investing since then, um, the currency as a factor in my total return, the 15% that Jeff referred to, has been about half of one percent a year as a tailwind. So um, the fear that the investors first confronted me with when I mentioned we'd invest abroad over the risk of the currency, I actually quite welcome as an investor with the chance that we could buy companies whose future dividend streams back to us might come back in stronger currencies as America um, spent down its inheritance in a, in a reckless man over time. Um, the accounting question, I, I, I had no particular reason to think that the American system, the U.S. system, uh, defined the best, the best and final word on accounting. Though I would say in 1987, the um, semi-annual report, you only got two reports from Nestle, I think the semi-annual report was maybe four pages long and may have suggested what they thought their revenues looked like possibly and welcomed you as being a shareholder. It wasn't very complete. But um, the truth is that the greatest accounting frauds that I think have been visited upon the, the investing scene since then have been uniquely American. You think about Enron or WorldCom. Those were extraordinarily detailed documents that were entirely fabricated. Even the other reports for Citigroup at, at Lehman Brothers were an art of high fiction. And so the original concerns over the fear of accounting and the fear of currency that I lived with it's a little bit more difficult as an American to branch out in global investing, however, and this is a, 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 sort of a couple of anecdotes because the, um, you, things get lost in translation. I remember one of my first investments um, was in um, a spirits company called Guinness, and they had a very strong business in Greece. And so we went to Greece, they sold a lot of Johnny uh, Walker Black label in, in Greece, and uh, we went to see the business there, and I had a side trip to a um, dairy that was a division of Unilever, and um, they had a, a separate annual report, and I was thumbing through it. Of course, it was all in Greek, and so I wasn't really up to the job, but I did see on the back page they had a graph that showed three lines like this, one of them straight, this one like this, and this one. And I said to the person I was speaking with that he must be proud of his results, and he said, why is that? I said, well, here's the graph. And, you know, usually people give graphs when the results are good. In the U.S., we have a requirement to put a graph like that on, on annual reports, and usually is the stock performance of the company the stock performance of the of the of the, um, of the sector, and then the S and P 500. And so I said, just look at this. I mean, here's your stock, and here's your sector, and here's the S and P. He said, No, that's not right. Um, this was um, labor costs. <laughs> <laughs> this were ingredient costs, and these were price increases. <laughs> and so, um, needless to say, I, I didn't invest in that one. But just the, the, the way in which you could find yourself in trouble stepping out into the foreign markets early on. I'm reminded of an early trip to Korea when um, we met with a confectionery company and, and the frustration of dealing through translators is, is really acute. And at one point we asked the um, vice chairman of the company what next year's cash flow prospects looked like and the, the translator and he spoke for about 40 minutes. <laughs> at, afterwards, the uh, translator turned to me and said, better. 
<laughs> you know, these are some of the early experiences of going abroad as an investor. At that point, I threw up my hands. I told the interpreter from then on, he had to break after every 30 seconds, tell me what was being said, because we could get nowhere with the answer better. I can't invest with better as the answer. And, uh, and then, just, just a little recent one, uh, Perno Ricard, which we'll speak about, uh, had an uh, annual report after they bought Absolute, and I was with the uh, president. Uh, and uh, I looked at the annual report and I blanched because it said that um, the president was welcoming, hold on a second, uh, <laughs> welcoming the new partners that had come from the acquisition of Absolute, and then it said, comma, the queen of vodka. And um, I said to him, you really don't want to go out with that because this is a brand you want to take overseas, you want to take it to Asia, you want to develop this brand and it's a big, powerful brand. And he said, no, the problem was the translation. Because in, in uh, French, vodka is feminine. And so if you wanted to call it the royal vodka, you have to call it the female, the queen of vodka. Somebody wants me over there, but uh, that's the second poem of mine. Which is better wrong. So, in any event, um, the, the um, challenges of going abroad early on, even throughout the present, you can throw that out, outside, Jeff, um, remain. And it, it also, however, is true that um, the 15 or 25 year record that Jeff showed has been extraordinarily blessed by our decisions to early on go overseas. Because if you think about 1984, Seven when I started, maybe 19, yeah, 1987 when I first invested um, in Nestle. China was closed. India was a closed market. Vietnam was, was a closed market. Um, Brazil hadn't really started to leap forward um, as it had not yet had a communist takeover and, and, and unleash the country for prosperity. Go figure. Um, but probably three and a half million, a billion people who would want to consume Nestle's products um, by virtue of an awareness of their existence were unable to. And they were unable to because markets were closed or because they didn't have the consumer disposable income to uh, purchase those products. Um, one of the messages that Buffett gave our class at business school was to choose areas to invest in that interest you. And, and, and let that define your circle of competence. And that's same within it. For me, um, the consumer is something that I find endlessly interesting. And there are enough different types of businesses that are uh, globally available that I pretty much stayed within the field of the consumer. And starting out as early as 1987 with Nestle, um, uh, we, we've had an enormous uh, unfair advantage as investors with an early orientation towards the international. Because, um, we've had so much white space to sell into. And our companies had brands that were strong enough to, um, to carry the investment along with, behind them, and then to respond to the consumer as the consumers became more prosperous and they had more disposable income. Um, my search then has been, from that time forward, to, to identify businesses that had the capacity to reinvest, um, and at the same time had the capacity to suffer. And the capacity to suffer one is something that's it's wildly overlooked, but it's terribly important. The capacity to reinvest is that you have a brand that the world cares for um, beyond the US, and I, I contrast Kraft Foods with Nestle. Kraft is a great US-based company. They have um, crackers, they have cheese, and they have meat. But most of what they have doesn't have much appeal beyond our shores. They're much more domestic company. Um, they lacked, in some ways, the capacity to reinvest behind the core business. And efforts to try to do so it came up short because organizationally, you know, the culture, the global culture that can implement. So they went into China to try to develop milk, and they pulled back because they didn't have the capacity to develop the brands, they didn't have the culture of people through whom to develop it. Nestle went into China as early as 1989. And they have a leading milk business, an infant formula business in China today. They have the capacity to reinvest behind the brand. 
and they have the institutional knowledge of what it's like to work in a country um, with as many, um, you know, country-specific uh, regulatory and, and, and corporate peculiarities as they face when they're acting activating the Chinese market. They have a portfolio of brands that matter, um, and they have the capacity to reinvest. However, um, it's not just enough to have the ability to reinvest, you have to have the stomach for it. And that's where capacity to suffer comes up. Um, and in an example, I'll give you a couple of them. Uh, Howard Schultz of Starbucks um, was at a meeting that I was at once, and it was about three or four years ago, and a young analyst asked him, when, when was he going to show Starbucks investors um, a profit from China. And he said, how big do you want us to be? And the analyst said, when are you show us profits from China? And he said, how big do you want us to be? And it went back and forth like a ping pong match. And finally, Schultz said, listen, kid, here's the deal. We're profitable in China today at the store level. We're not profitable in China today at the country level. We may not be for a very long time, and the longer I'm allowed not to be profitable, the better our business will be. Because during the process of reinvesting the profits from the early stores, um, they had an appetite and ambition that was national, and it meant that they had to set up depots and manufacturing facilities that had to advertise in advance of demand. And none of that was going to generate early profits. In fact, it was going to generate losses. But the first mover advantage in consumer products companies is enormous. If you develop the coffee category in a country like China, you've really developed something of lasting value. Um, and in order to get out in front of competitors, you have to, as a management team, have the capacity to let those early investments burden income. And, um, and, and not every com company has this, this lucky confluence. Not everyone has, asset, has brands that can be invested behind. More importantly, few have the capacity to suffer. And that's because most managers of public companies abide by Wall Street's creed of steady and small uh, and, and, uh, and uh, unvarying quarterly profit growth. And if you embark upon a plan to expand globally and, and to, to exploit the potential for your brands, you're going to disrupt anything that's quite orderly about it for profit growth. And you'll do so while building that present value. And that's, that's where the capacity is suffer. Why some companies have it and others don't on the, on the capacity to suffer front is they have control shareholders. And that's where that agency costs, and that's where, that's where I, I think we've added some value in the process of investing. Um, by selecting businesses that still have family control, which allows the management to know that if they embark on an investing program, midstream through it, they won't lose control of the company because their earnings go down. Because the families who are in, in, in most of our companies still um, sizable owners can say to the management, look, we'll cover you because nobody can take the co company over from us because we have effective control. And we, we understand the investment process burdens income and we're in it for a long time. Because we're actually building this not for, not for Wall Street analysts, but for our grandkids. And to spend today against the future is what, what, is what they authorize and they encourage. Most of these lessons I've learned through listening to Warren Buffett over the years. And Buffett in, 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 um, describes this same capacity to suffer in three important divisions that he's experienced. The first one was Geico. He owned 50% of Geico. He bought the other 50%. When he took full control, they had about 2 million policies, which is about 2% of the U.S. market. It's, it was um, a preferred insurance product, and he believed it, and he asked the head of the company, why did they not have a bigger market share? And the head said, um, it's simple. The cost in year one of the new policy is $250. You lose $250 in reported earnings the first year you put a policy on a Geico, but the net present value of that policy, because of high renewals and no brokerage, no agent fees, and because of a low combined ratio and low expenses, means that the net present value in year one, the moment you put on that account, is $1,500 or more. So the reason why Geico independently couldn't grow as fast as the market would allow it if they pushed the pedal harder was they couldn't absorb that loss, uh, that, that, that upfront loss. Um, uh, inside Berkshire, they could. 
because Berkshire is not dependent on its, on its uh, survival by meeting quarterly numbers. In fact, their greatest strength in some ways is that they're unfettered by that obligation. They have enormous opportunities because of that. And, um, and so since then, it's probably been 12 years since they took control, they've gone from 2 million policies to 11 million. And if you think that that $1,500 per policy benefit to net present value of the business grows and stays at least constant, they've added $13 billion of value to Berkshire by just reorienting the, um, the trade-off between reported profits and wealth. And um, you've seen how that money's been spent because you know on television every advertisement <coughs> is either a lizard or a caveman. And they've taken their advertising budget from $30 million to $950 million in Geico over this period of time. They're spending against income for future wealth. And that's something um, they did that with, uh, with their willingness to hold cash when the interest rates dropped so much. And they held $55 billion of cash, earning less than a percent going into the crash of 08. Compare that to GE, who I'll use as an example of companies in general in North America. They were, they were a pretty extreme case. Um, GE had close to a hundred billion dollars of its liabilities, which are the, the, the liabilities that are intended to run the company forever. They had a hundred billion dollars of those liabilities in overnight money. And the reason they did it, is instead of taking a conservative um, balance sheet approach of having short-term, mid-term, long-term, and very long-term debt, which matches the, the duration of their assets and their business plans to be in business for a while. They drove it all to short-term overnight money because they were only paying less than 1% on $100 billion. If they had a standard interest rate structure, they would have been paying closer to 4%. And that extra 3%, the $3 billion of, of expense was, was eliminated from the reported profits by, by short, shortening the maturity of their debt beyond that which is prudent. Berkshire, taking the exact opposite approach, was preserving wealth while understanding the possible um, income that they could have enjoyed if they had taken their, um, their borrowing, their assets, into the longer term. It all came together in a, a great frothy storm in the middle of the um, crash of 08, and, and GE could not roll over their debt. Uh, because even though bankers assured them that any time they wanted they could swap in and out of short term or long term, the reality was when the markets froze up, they couldn't roll it over. And so they offered Berkshire terms that I think were 12% money plus uh, warrants to buy their shares at an attractive price. And so you can see the consequence to that moment of favoring the, the short term over the long term. Uh, in the case of GE, it was very costly. Buffett was very rewarding. The last area that Buffett shows that in, uh, was in the uh, equity index put options that they have, have written. They received $5 billion for a $37 billion exposure. I think they received that much money because I don't think anybody else would have taken the transaction. Because under accounting, if those equity market exposures that he insured against uh, declining, uh, with the put options that he sold, if those, um, as those markets went down, he ran the risk of, uh, let me see something here. He ran the risk of, uh, where's my, let's see, technical. <laughs> um, he, ran, he ran the risk of uh, having to report those, those changes in his liability through his income statement. So um, I, I drew up this uh, spreadsheet. Let's just see. Yeah, here it is. Um, I hope it's visible because what it shows, um, I think, quite interestingly, is what, what Berkshire was willing to absorb, the capacity to suffer that I'm referring to. Uh, who's, is it? Am I doing that? It's it's quite palpable here. Yeah. Um, so, so he puts, he gets $5 billion, which he has the right to invest for roughly 15 years. 
And at the end of that period of time, uh, he has to settle up. But along the way, the markets, the markets moved, and in 2008, they moved a lot. If you look at the full year in 2008, Berkshire had to absorb a pre-tax charge of $9 billion because of the decline in, in the value of those equity markets, which he insured against. So his, his um, payable went up by $9 billion. In a year, when the total reported pre-tax income from Berkshire was only $7, million, $7 billion. Um, you know, similarly, in the third quarter of 2011, Berkshire earned only $3.3 billion. Well, you know, part of that was because they had to pass through a $2.4 billion to, uh, provision uh, against the ultimate uh, value of the, of the, um, of the um, equity markets and the insurance against the client. Well, this, this stuff will go on for the next 10 years before, before the, uh, maybe seven years before the terms are finally settled. Along the way, he will have invested that $5 billion well, and it will compound, and that will be his money. And probably, I suspect, um, the equity markets at the end will probably look a lot like they were when you put the insurance on, and he probably won't pay out any premium. But certainly, during the period of time, if he were at all dependent on smooth and steady earnings reports, um, rather than focus on building wealth, he never could have entered into this contract. And so, whether it's keeping his cash unfettered, earning only 0.2% um, during the 2008 period, or whether it was driving GEICO's growth at the expense of current income. Um, along the way, uh, you've seen, uh, from just watching Berkshire uh, perform, uh, a great example of how you can um, use this computer. Uh, <laughs> and if I went to PowerPoint, it would be big help. Thanks. Uh, well, then one other thing, you go back to uh, the uh, second Berkshire one. Do we have? No, that's Perry Henry. That's an intrinsic value for sure. Um, I'll just, I'll, since I'm on the topic of Berkshire, I'll, I'll jump to a, a different slide here. It's sort of interesting. Um, uh, it'll be something we address later on, but um, one of the things that having a lot of cash also allows Berkshire to do um, uh, is. Um, to weigh in to retire shares during a period of time when he thinks the intrinsic value is far greater than the market value. And he's only announced it twice in history. Once was in 1999 when he said he would buy back the shares um, at, at, I think it was $40,000 a share, and um, the market re recovered, and he never was able to buy any shares back. But if you impute a um, an intrinsic value based on a margin of safety that he would have required to buy back the shares and then follow Berkshire's um, own suggestion that his intrinsic value over the ensuing years has grown about the same percentage rate as the uh, book value per share has grown. You can increase the um, value of the intrinsic value um, to the period of 2011 when, when the shares were at 100,000, he came back in and said, I'll buy back the stock. And in each case, he's basically buying what looks like sort of $0.60 bills. And, and the math of a company that has liquidity, as, as Berkshire has kept, even at the cost of current income, it doesn't make anything but two or three uh, tenths of a percent on that cash. Um, having that cash run at the time, like in September 2011, when the market thought the shares were only worth 52% um, of what the intrinsic value putatively had grown to meant that he had a terrific um, vehicle to increasing the intrinsic value of the remaining shares by buying back his uh, outstanding shares at a 48% discount. And for the first time, he began to buy. The prior episode, he couldn't buy because he was, um, he was um, uh, the, the share price went up and recovered. So, Berkshire has given an enormous number of examples, here, here, here they were, of the ways in which um, having the ability to suffer um, empowers a company uh, to, uh, let's see here. All right, now, the next one is Nestle. Capacity to reinvest uh, for Nestle comes from this extraordinary brand portfolio of the guy. And the fact that they've been in 130 countries around the world uh, for the past 80 to 100 years. Um, 
and uh, many of the the the, the, uh, the the catalyst which drives their investment is is expressed by a slide that they've used in, in, in presentations before, which is the growth in GDP, which occurs in countries at increasing rates around the world. Um, leads to a growth in consumer disposable income. And with that, consumers for the first time ever are finding their way towards um, products that Nestle manufactures. The so brands have been in the atmosphere because they've been in countries all along, and they've just been unaffordable. They are aspirational, and they're also, they're also life-changing. They also go along with the fact that part of the process of increasing GDP is that people enter the workforce both, both spouses enter the work, workforce, and they need something that doesn't take as much labor to prepare. Uh, a perfect example of that would be the Maggie Bullion Cube, where all over Africa and, and developing emerging markets today, Nestle sells uh, billions of dollars of bullion cubes, and in most of the markets, they sell them one cube at a time. Uh, that's what's affordable. It's a popularly priced product. It delivers an enormous amount of nutrition, and um, it becomes the it becomes the ingredient around which meals are made in a more a, a quicker and a, a more modern manner. Whether it's Nescafe coffee for the first time, a Maggie Bullion cube, whether it's um, uh, let's see what else here, uh, uh, any number of the brands that you see there, um, they are growing with the rise of consumerism, and um, and they're investing behind uh, uh, such opportunities even at uh, the cost of current income. Upper, upper rightmost corner there, there's a brand called Nespresso. It's a product that um, Nestle, Nestle engineers came up with about a dozen years ago. And it's a single serve, uh, high quality uh, uh, espresso. And uh, it cost them hundreds of millions of dollars in, in development expenses. They, they belabored it, it took a long time to come out. It's, it has its own dedicated channel of, of distribution through company-owned stores and the internet. It's a, digitally, uh, you know, it's a, it's a digital commerce uh, route to market. Uh, having, having the capacity to see this product through uh, its, 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 its uh, beta startup and then through commercialization has meant that they've been able to develop a product that today does over $4 billion of revenue and is still growing at over 20%. It's one of the most extraordinary success stories in Nestle's history, and the only way they were able to get it there was by having the willingness to burden the profitability of their Nescafe business and other lines uh, during the startup period. Um, the, <coughs> several instances where they've suffered through uh, a period where they haven't abandoned the markets, even though it came at high costs to their reported profits. In 1998, the Russian ruble market uh, crisis meant that um, imported products, which they were largely selling at the time, really found no buyers because the currency crisis meant that there were no dollars around their dollar-based commerce. Um, this question we talked about, um, now they, they stayed in Russia when most of their competitors abandoned Russia. And today, because they have the capacity to stay, one thing happens. Uh, there's no better time to invest behind a brand and to, and to develop a business than the time when a market's in chaos because you can harness resources at a very low cost. When everything's moving well along, um, and you want to build a new factory, you have to stand in line and bed for the contractor to come and work for you. It'll cost you 10 times what it should cost you. In the middle of a ruble crisis, and they show up with a little bit of money, they can command the entire market. And so they stay, they build, they have a leading share in, in, um, in ice cream, in, in uh, Nescafe, where they've now put a third factory in Russia and, and what, what really excites me is hearing about a business um, that's capable, because of their, their past and their brands and their, and their management capacity, to put a couple hundred million dollars to work in, a, in an Escafé factory in, in Russia, which will absolutely not run at anywhere near peak capacity for the first couple of years. But when it does, it will generate an enormous return. And they have the capacity to do that again and again and again. And most, most, um, Investors overlook the value of this capacity to reinvest and the capacity to suffer through it. Um, um, Nestle and Kraft trade for roughly the same multiple. 
and craft lacks any of this organic um, uh, capacity to reinvest. Um, they spent on Nespresso, we've talked about that, China and India, they were very early, they spent a lot of money. Alcon, they owned um, from 1970 to the year 2010, they paid $200 million to take control, uh, to, to buy control of Alcon, and they sold it to Novartis in um, 2010 for $40 billion. Along the way, they received very little credit for it. Um, uh, it wasn't, it, it didn't contribute to earnings in, in, in the fashion that that $40 billion would have contributed to earnings. And yet they stayed the course. Um, and most recently, they just acquired um, uh, two um, confectionery com a confectionery company and a um, beverage company in, in China. Uh, uh, Paranormal Retard is a, a slightly different story. Same premise, terrific brands. Uh, in the year 2000, one of the um, uh, major opportunities for, for Paranormal arose when the, the leading competitor in China left the market uh, and took back their prominent cognac and whiskey because China went through an economic downturn in the early 2000 period and the company, a, a Western-based company, didn't want to suffer the earnings pressure on keeping a presence in the country when, when it was economically struggling. Karen Ricard, which is controlled by the Ricard family, looked at the market and thought that this was a market with 500 million cases of spirits consumed a year. Um, it's largely local spirits, it's called Baiju, and it's, uh, as he smiles, <laughs> um, how many people here have had Baiju? Wow. And you survived to tell the story. <laughs> Anyways, so um, here's the deal. The Ricard family takes a look at the market and says, you know, I think the Chinese market have a proven taste for spirits. And they may want to they may want to internationalize their preferences a bit. And so they went into the market at the time when their competitors pulled out with Martel on the cognac and with and with and with Chivas and Valentine for Scotch whiskey. They um, helped pioneer the pattern in China of consuming Scotch whiskey with equal parts pre-mixed green tea. And, and they proved up the market. Today, um, Perno makes 15% of its operating profit in China from, uh, uh, from a standing start 12 years ago. The competitor who left is desperately trying to get back in. It's tough because the consumers now have brand preference for Chivas and for Valentine's and Scotch and for Martel and, and Cognac. And those who left to protect their income statements had a harder time now coming back in to try to take share back. Um, that's one story about, uh, about Paranormal. I think it's an interesting one. Another story is that they did buy Absolute. We referred to it earlier with that funny language uh, issue. But it wasn't at all funny when they bought it because it was in 2008. And um, just after they agreed to buy Absolute, which they, they believe they need to fill out their portfolio with a whiskey, a cognac, a champagne, and a, uh, and a vodka, um, the world went into a sharp tailspin. <coughs> um, the, um, the credit of, uh, and, and, um, and Perno faced financing burdens on a 5 billion euro acquisition, and the uh, financing markets shut down. It was a perfect opportunity for, sh for short sellers to come in and, and through concerted efforts in the credit default swap markets, create a crisis, a funding crisis for Perno. I owned the shares. I bought them the year before, and it became the number one short stock on, um, on the Euro 100. The credit default swaps went from 50 to 780, which suggests, as you can imagine, the financial peril that the company faced. And, um, and so uh, this is the capacity to suffer. They bought the business, um, not knowing that 2008 would have a financial meltdown to be no meltdown. But they knew that they'd have to stretch to put it to bed, but this, this almost took the firm to the break. Now, um, the, uh, the risks were overstated. They had uh, a, a, a spare brand in their portfolio called um, uh, Wild Turkey. <laughs> How many hands? Wild turkey? Not nearly so many. Um, 
They sold it for $800 million. That helped resolve some of the funding crisis. They had um, a rights offering with the family, still family control, the family pointed up. And, uh, and then they, um, they, they had some outside capital come in from new investors. And the bottom line is they avoided the financing crisis. They now have absolute as part of their portfolio. Uh, but, but they lived, they had the capacity to suffer through this because, because the uh, family <coughs> control gave them the assurance that they wouldn't lose the company during that downturn. Now, there's a great, there's a great sub-message here, which is uh, I talk about the capacity to suffer on the part of the families, uh, the managements of the company that embark upon thoughtful investing, uh, capacity to reinvest. Um, but I fail to say that investors also have to have, have, to have that capacity to suffer. And so I, as a money manager, had a 6% position in Parano Repart that probably went down 60% over the course of that credit default swap short sale squeeze. Um, so if my investors uh, were as demanding as Wall Street is of company quarterly numbers, if they wanted me to be smooth and steady, I would have lost my investors. So I have to inform them that, by the way, once in a while we're going to get that uh, key buffalo coming at us. And uh, we may have to run. But you know, the long term, things will be fine. That reassurance is required. Otherwise, my investors might say, Enough, uh, enough pain, let's, let's exit. Paranoid has the capacity to suffer. I think they'll continue down that path. India is an enormous opportunity and that the number one premium Scotch whiskey in the market of 100 million cases. Just, um, just last week, there was a story in, in um, the, the market in India is passionate about Scotch whiskey. Unfortunately, um, it's very regulated, very controlled, and the government doesn't let the products come into the market that the market covets. Uh, regulatory change will, will ensue most likely, it's just a question of when and how. As a, as a leverage to that regulatory change, uh, news such as two weeks ago when 170 uh, Indians died drinking um, uh, fabricated whiskey that was made out of, I don't know, whatever was made out of some shoe coloring, it killed 170 people. So the country confronts this reality which is the market wants something. They don't allow it. Um, the market will ultimately find its way to something, but what they get is untaxed, it's unsafe, and it's, um, it's not branded. And, um, and so I think the resolution will be a very, very powerful up for Perno, who will have the capacity to reinvest an enormous amount behind driving that Scotch whiskey business. Uh, SAB Miller is the last company we'll talk about. Uh, you know, just like the others, they start out with a great portfolio. They then they then start from a very small base in, in South Africa, and each time they go to make an acquisition, they bring this this uh, team of uh, knowledgeable uh, market uh, and, and, and activation experts to the market. So they bought the Columbia market in uh, in uh, 2008. Um, and I visited the Columbia market in 2008, and I, I witnessed how they had taken a, a, a monopoly beer business that was run by a family, local family, uh, and turned it into sort of an international standard. Um, they'd taken the EBITDA from the business up by 30%, and, and it stood as a, an example of what kind of internal capacities they had to expand and reinvest behind their brand portfolio. Um, that was in early 08. I visited, I, I, I bought the shares. They proceeded to drop 60% that year because it was the year of the, of the great uh, financial meltdown. Um, their credit default swaps also went up during the same period of time because they too had a financing that they had a um, complete, it wasn't nearly so stressful. But the more interesting one on this slide is if you look most recently at the 2012 numbers, you'll see the credit default swap uh, costs are going up again. Um, Despite that, and what I applaud for the company, is um, they had yet again this, 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 this virtue of being willing to do something that's good for the long term while the company was bad for current. And they extended the term on close to $3 billion worth of debt. Um, and in so doing, increased their interest burden by three or 400 basis points per year. But they now have secure capital structure. They could have left their money um, still in shorter term exposures at lower rates, but it would be less, less prudent and less uh, thoughtful for the long term um, and, and, and less uh, wealth building, I, I think. Um, uh, they have um, uh, suffered through um, 
an investment program to build uh, the number one brand in China. Um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, somebody dropped a slide, it's the most important slide that I can show uh, how this thing works. Um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's a market with 400 million barrels of beer consumed each year. 400 million barrels. Only 90 million barrels of that are bottled. The rest are manufactured locally through, um, um, through small gatherings where you make homemade beer. Um, they're investing heavily behind the uh, movement, migration from homemade to bottled beer. So the capacity, the white space is already known. It's a 400 million barrel market. Um, they have 300 million barrels to shoot for. And in the process of investing uh, funds, they've taken their their revenue from 600 million up to a billion, uh, and their operating margin down from 22 percent to 16. Well, you know, book if you if pa by pass if you mean book value, or more like past past financial figures, past income statements yeah. and balance sheet. Well, I think those help you understand what the intrinsic value is today. Mm -hmm. um, in, at some level, um, they're a big component, but, but as I said, if what's past is what you're buying and, and it's devoid of the future, um, you're going to have to sell it because the only thing you've accomplished is you've in theory bought it as a discount to what's not worth. The now worth portion being a function of all of its historic backward looking value. But to, to move the investment forward, you have to close that discount. So you have to agitate the management to unlock the values that are embedded in it, and I'm, I'm not an activist. And it's taxable, and um, and your return, your 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 your, your compound rate of return, is entirely dependent on how quickly you close that gap. Because if it's not growing, then then the only thing you can accomplish is, is getting your money's worth from what you paid in this come together. And just follow up on yeah. that. So. Are you doing DCF models looking forward and discounting the present? Yeah. That's, that's yeah, that's that's essentially what we do. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, we, we place a much higher value on our belief in the company's ability to, to surprise us out in the future off of their expanded platform. And so we 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 more highly praise the future in businesses that are typically looked at as 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 stale value. And, and, and the, the, the related point there would be um, you know, I did mention this, this, this issue about European exposure. You know, most of the world today, when they think about Nestle or Heineken, S.A.B. Miller, apparently, we've got all of which are large positions, all of which are European, they see only contraction throughout Europe. And I think in so doing, they don't give the businesses credit for the capacity to grow in the rest of the world where their products are covered. We own a company that owns Cartier, a luxury watch manufacturer. And they now sell 50% of their finest watches in Paris to visiting uh, uh, travelers from mainland China. 50% of the business in France is already done with uh, visiting. And they've opened up 300 stores throughout China, and they're growing at a rapid pace. Um, that's all embedded in a company that looks like it's kind of troubled because it's European roots. It's the European heritage that makes the product appealing. And so we own it, despite the European nexus, it's because the blend of a history plus a future is what excites us. Thanks. Yes, and just a question about uh, the capacity to, to suffer. Yeah. You mentioned that you look for a family owned business, but yeah. uh, those type of businesses disappearing rather quickly. So, other than the family owned nature of, uh, of control, what, uh, what else do you, do you look at? As to whether the management has the predilection, yes. well, you know, Nestle's not um, family controlled. Um, it just has the proper mindset. I mean, I remember meeting with the CEO once. He was asked what the company's planning horizon was, and he said, "35 years." Right. Suppose you don't have the honor to meet the CEO. <laughs> well, then, then it's back to the Baijiu. <laughs> I have no recommendation. No, um, no I mean, really, it, 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 there, 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 there are spoken words. There are, um, there are, um, you know, the results themselves. You can see that they're putting money to work. Um, um, but you're right. I mean, if you see those SAV numbers, it looks like they've actually been making a mess of Africa. 
because the operating margin went from 22 to 69. And they often don't say, you know, by the way, don't be confused. You know, we're really, we're really putting it up to the future. Um, it's, it is conversations with management about, about those um, insights about how they value the future that, that increases my conviction as an investor um, to, um, to invest in the face of numbers that are suppressed because of current investment spending. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Um, I guess my question would be, like through the recession, how did you view and value companies that say you had a caterpillar, for example, when earnings fell and the revenue fell, um, how would you go about valuing that in a recession versus in a normal trend? Yeah. So everything's falling, so how, what do you do to kind of do a base case scenario for how they're going to be in the future? I don't really um, do that all that much, but I think the people who would think about average historic earnings power through a cycle and then they then they say you know this is way below what the replacement level will require of that and therefore you can expect over time to make a recovery off of that and have some sense of what the, the trailing five years might have generated in terms of, of cash flow and, 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 and income and then and then think about whether or not the, the press price based on current results uh, gives them a, a, a low enough entry price to bear the risk that the recovery may be slower than the, than the comma. And they need to make sure that the company has, has ample cash and staying power so that they can see themselves through that process. For me, one of the things with Caterpillar um, is simply you know, my, my concern over, uh, over the enduring nature of their competitive advantage up against uh, aging competitors who ultimately, I think, will show their face. At the moment, it's very hard to because it's hard to duplicate that deal with that one. But, um, but I think you'd have a five-year kind of look back with a sense of, uh, of the past being a pretty good survey for the future. Okay. Yeah. So I'm pretty interested in some of the investments you have. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for example, you know, when horses were the main source of transportation and cars came out, you didn't see people flock to investing in horses, right? Similarly, I see you have Washington Post and a couple of tobacco companies up there. Uh, there. Maybe there's some value in here, but what's your reasoning for having these companies in your portfolio right now? And maybe why why aren't you thinking about selling them um, since that's your kind of... It's a good question. Um, you know, the, the Washington Post is the last of a holdout that I, I would have poorly, poorly um, distinguished myself with the newspapers. So one of the things that I think about in investing is um, you know, I, I like to invest in, in businesses that have proven have been a proven source of fortunes, enduring firm of fortunes. So you know, if someone said, gosh, you know, we could put together a chain of dry cleaners, people need to have their clothes dry cleaned every day, wouldn't that be cool? I, said, mm -hmm. I don't know a lot of really rich dry cleaners. Um, but I knew a lot of really rich newspaper fans. They were family-controlled businesses, so they're supposed to have the future in mind. And they had a history of deflecting technological assaults over decades. Radio came along and threatened their franchise. TV came along and threatened their franchise. Cable TV came along. And then along came the internet. You know, they were offered as a consortium um, to be the lead financers of Amazon originally. Um, and, oh, excuse me, it was eBay, eBay originally offered. The model for eBay was to go to the newspapers because they had classifieds and allow eBay to power up an electronic classified. And they take a little cut of the business and the newspapers collectively said, no, we're too big, we're too strong, we don't need you, go away. It was in the moment of decision that they, that they missed um, this turn and they, and they didn't recognize just how disruptive it would be. I didn't either, I owned a lot of them. Um, the Post is the last one that we hold, um, and it is really not the newspaper. The newspaper is probably, probably worth a little bit, but not much. But they have other businesses that are worth a lot, and that's, they just have the name that's backward-looking, but the businesses that are forward-looking are not at all the in the newspaper. And as far as tobacco is concerned, um, you know, it's a, um, a slow-dying business. But the investment there is different than the other investments where I talk about white space and growth and all the rest, is that the loyalties are high and the cash flow is high. And we can pencil out a, a, an attrition going 
going to zero, as the business is likely will over time, that can still reward our investors a decent return over that period. Just a quick follow up then. Yeah. If there was a company in a completely dying industry, but you valued it, saying that it was undervalued in the market, would you still buy the company knowing that the industry was dying? It, it's the, I think it's the case of Philip Morris, I mean, mainly altered the U.S. version. The international one would be different, I think, but the U.S. one's going away, which is kind of over time. And, um, you know, um, they kind of recognize that, and they're managing under stress to, to gain skin control. And, uh, but it is, it's, it's not a business, I can tell you, you know, we're going to wake up one day and then I reinvest. It's a, you know, capacity of soccer through your investment spending off that goes to the races. I just don't, I just would be surprised if that outcome occurred. But I think a, a slow and, 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 uh, and, and coordinated erosion over time is something that can still reward investors. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. What do, you, what do you think is the correct relationship between value investing, we're just kind of looking at the fundamentals of a company, and also sort of looking at macro as well? You talked earlier about how you didn't want a professor to teach that sort, yeah. of, sort of macro overall course. But if you're a U.S. investor investing in companies abroad, you must take a view on the value of currencies either in the U.S. or abroad. So how do you kind of balance that split? And yeah. on that point, what is your view of those currencies? You no, know, I think by virtue of the portfolio position, it expresses a view that I think you know the um, the currency orientation in the portfolio is is answered by the question compared to what. So the issue as an American U.S. based investor is what have we what have we done with my investors' capital through this portfolio? Well, we have sixty percent exposure to uh, European companies. 70 if you count Philip Morris, which is all international. Um, and, and maybe 20% of it's Swiss franc exposed, and 30% of it's euro exposed, and 10% uh, British pound. And all of those have their own challenges, but do, and, and, and critically appraised from the United States, they all look crummy. But a critical line in the U.S. is not very revealing, and it's not very pleasing. Um, we have close to 90% of our GDP now um, uh, <coughs> levels of, of, of national indebtedness, and, and we're showing no sign of slowing that down at all. We're going to spend like mad uh, over the next years. Uh, we're not a um, bastion of uh, solid uh, financial strength that we once were. I actually think that we see over time America kind of um, playing out the, the, the scorecard that England played in the 19, early 1900s where their economic hegemony was eroded. And it was eroded because there was a much stronger competitor that had been in the East, much like we were to them, um, aging to us. And over time, you know, things happened. Uh, I, was, I was speaking recently with somebody about this thought, and I said, you know, we'll ultimately lose the reserve currency, and she said, you're going to lost it. Uh, he said that in China, most of the trade delegations today are striking contract terms in renminbi or in their local currencies, but not in dollars. And it used to be that trade was struck in dollars, but increasingly it's not. And um, so I think, you know, um, in the case of, a, of, of those European companies, um, a couple other points, um, Europe, because of its crisis, is becoming in some manner, a, a more effective place to do business. And Nestle owns Perry and gives a good example of what happened. They had a terrible labor arrangement with the French uh, workforce for Perry. And it wasn't until just last year that they were able to get relief. All the 14 prior years, the French government absolutely resisted any efforts, and, and, and the company was completely empty handed many times to change. But you know, at the same time, Sarkozy had to extend the work week and extend the, re the re retirement age. They had to also look at the terms of, of by which they ask companies to do business in France, and they they were lending. And today, uh, the uh, the Perry now has the terms that make the production in, in France profitable, and they're spending a lot of money for the first time in a decade advertising the brand, and it's growing sharply for the first time because they've been able to get relief. And, you know, um, across Europe, 
some of these long, long, uh, unaddressed questions about economic um, viability and effectiveness are being addressed. And so companies, even in Europe, um, despite how troubled it is, are, are, are making some progress and being allowed to run their businesses more thoughtfully. And then, you know, you tell me what happens when, um, you know, uh, SAB Miller's is English-based, um, starts to receive those dividends coming back from Africa. Are they going to come back in stronger currencies relative to the pound, relative to the dollar? I think so. I think the parts of the world that are growing in economic vitality will have a stronger currency over time. So if I might just do a quick follow-up. Uh, what do you think about someone like Jim Rogers then who invests mostly in, in commodities as opposed to stocks? I'll tell you off days, it's a funny question, but, um, you know, um, I happen, I, I'm not a commodity-minded investor, um, and so I, I, I've actually taken a pass on, on that, but uh, I, I prefer businesses, you know, I, the concept of having a team of people who can grow a business um, is much more alluring to me than, 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 than um, Betting on on what is unfortunately likely to be in the next world rise anyhow, I just I just prefer investing in business that I can see the products develop. Yeah. Hi, thank you, Father. Would you say a, a question? You uh, the concept of using your investing capacity is, is to, for my understanding, is investing the capacity of the firm and also the capacity of the management team and the people at eventually. So, uh, but management changes. Yeah. How do you define that this is the team I want to keep with and in the future, even though they replace management, they're going to keep continue making the right decisions? It's, it's a, that's, that's the $65,000 question. Um, by the way, uh, that's why I showed you that pagoda. Remember the picture at the start with the Mount Fuji in the background and the Japanese temple? You know, that's, that's why that's there. Is, you know, our goal is to find businesses that have a culture that can be um, uh, continued. So S.A.B. Miller, here, it's a very funny question. Uh, S.A.B. Miller is as good as it is. And Hauser Bush Invest Brazilian managers are as good as they are. Because in each case, the team that forms the core of that business, each business, grew up commercially under the most challenging circumstances in the world. SAB was a part of South African breweries, and it was a um, it was a embargoed land. Um, they they couldn't get materials. They had to they had to make do with very scarce resources. And the management in that situation became really first first rate. Um, when they took their skill set um, first over to the United States when they bought a company called Rolling Rock, and then to Poland when they took the proceeds from selling Rolling Rock to Poland, they just cleaned up. Uh, in, 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 in the order of advance, uh, they've taken over the world now with the second largest brewer in the world. They're start, they, have, they have long ago run out of those battle-hardened South Africans. So the management team now relies on the people who, who train in Poland under these South Africans and now go from Poland to Colombia or to um, Australia. But, but the, real, the real hard work, the culture was set by that team that, that struggled under such adversity and learned how to really get the job done with scarce resources and that developed the winning culture. Um, and my hope, my bet, I have an investment predicated on this, is that it's going to be able to be carried down generations. But, but the more certain period of time is behind us. And that was the period of time when that team that was extraordinary took over so much of the world. Oh, so a little follow-up. So if, because the workforce is becoming international, yeah. and then you, you are investing internationally, those companies are like uh, going abroad, and they have to recruit people from those countries as well. So there will be more concerns about these questions? Oh, absolutely. No, it's very interesting in the beer business. Again, um, you know, as, as I suggested, that Polish um, SAB worker who could easily go to Colombia, South America, to, to affect change that's needed in that market in light of all the knowledge that they have with the rest of the world. You could not move that person to help SAB's Romanian business succeed because there's too much history 
between Poland and Romania, um, or between Poland and Hungary. So those 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 migrations just don't work. But to go um, around the world, you, you have to be you have to be alert. Having a global talent pool is a valuable asset, though, as opposed to an American company where you have to understand in North in, in the U.S. Um, I would think less than five percent of the population is actually fluent in the second. Um, 5% of the English-speaking population is, is fluent in the second language. Much less the head of Nestle who speak five languages on the run. So that global, that global uh, talent base, I think, is an asset. It's very hard to be sensitive to all the histories, but I think it's still an asset. Will you consider like, investing education in the future? Well, that's the backside of the Washington Post, is they own Kaplan Education. And that's the business that's inside the post that we still own. Was that the question about yeah. like, commercial education? Not really, like education. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Education, like in new business generations, and yeah. they have the concept of value investing and the philosophy of doing the business instead of just getting money. Just yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. All right. So you mentioned the same time. <laughs> She's been drinking by me. <laughs> She'd be better off if she was drinking by <laughs> All right, so uh, my question kind of goes to, uh, as you've mentioned a few times, that you're mostly invested in European companies. Um, but with the shift of globalization, and as you mentioned also, uh, more and more open economies, do you see, do you foresee a shift in the geographical origin of the companies that you'll be investing in? Yeah, or? it'll come. I'm sure it will. Um, um, you know, what I've liked up until now is the global nature of those European companies that allow them to move around the world. Um, in, in China, there are really great companies. In fact, Nestle just bought two of them. They bought a great confectionery company and a great beverage company. Um, the people with whom I train own shares of that great Chinese protection company. They were disappointed because Nestle didn't pay enough for the company. I was glad <laughs> um, that they did. Um, but they thought that the business was knowable enough, and it had a founder who still lived on the factory premise in a small house, and he, and, and he had something like 60,000 workers in the factory. And his house was right there, and you know, he said, well, there's lines of the work. <laughs> and that's an extraordinary owner mind in this, and he's going to keep 40% of the business. Um, uh, what happens, though, why I still have preferred the internationals, is that, um, you know, at some point, even China becomes developed. And, and for Cartier, they have too many stores, and the diminishing returns on new stores. They can take that brand and go somewhere else. It's going to take some time before we have companies, I think, in, in China or other markets where they have the same global opportunity set um, that the Western companies still enjoy because of legacies. But they'll get there. I mean, then you have them starting out in, 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 in some areas, but they just haven't surfaced in the areas that I spend much of my time on. Perfect. Certainly, Lenovo would be a global company, Hire would be a global company. There are global companies, and I'm, I'm sure we'll invest in some that are outside of the West. Is there a threshold that you're waiting for, or are you just kind of waiting until they're... Well, you know, look, it's still, it's still complicated. Um, you know, um, I know people who own dairy companies in China, but um, one of the things, I'm waiting for the culture to firm up a little bit, because you know, in, the, in that specific area, um, regularly you'll read about companies that are accused of lacing milk with melamine and killing children in the process. And we're trying to invest for a very long period of time, and we can't afford that kind of reputational hit to a business. Um, uh, in, in China, as fast-paced as things are, people are willing to risk that kind of censure, because if they can get, get it done long enough, they'll have a lot of money, they'll move on and do something else, the company notwithstanding. We, we don't have that flexibility. We want to be with something that lasts for a very long time. And you're starting to see businesses at a scale that's big one for us to invest in um, that are starting to have that characteristic, like that confectionery company, which we didn't own, but um, we do now through Nestle. Uh, but I'm sure that, that we'll find businesses like that. Uh, yeah, no question about it. Yeah. 
Hi. Um, Hello. First of all, thank you for coming. Um, one thing that I found interesting about your talk tonight was that you said that basically Wall Street is too focused on the short term and earnings quarter to each quarter. And uh, the one thing that I was wondering, I guess, about that was how do you differentiate them when a company is losing money? Um, and how can you kind of see through that, that they're not just you know, going to continue down a downward spiral and there's actually sort of a light in the tunnel? And sort of on that point, is there anything quantitative that you can look towards, or is it all sort of qualitative? You know, the old light, light at the end of the tunnel story is, is it a light or is it a train? <laughs> you try to avoid those where it's a train coming at you, and that was certainly in the newspaper business. So I just got the clobbered with, with staying in that field too long. Um, it's a really good question because I, I've said tonight what I like to look for are businesses that have the capacity to reinvest because of their brands, they have the capacity to suffer through reinvestments because doing startups require that you end up with subscale um, you know, demand at the start and therefore you don't know, absorb your costs and you can't be profitable. And yet when I talk to Zestly or the companies I knew we were other places about it, they often say that it's not, it's not actually the way it happens. Because it's very hard for a company to actually reward its, its workers off anything other than operating profit and uh, a fairly straight and simple level, a model. Um, and, and so um, I'm probably more optimistic about the virtues of suffering than are the people who run our businesses who have to make sure that people don't go off the reservation and just become sloppy and lazy, but that they demand a really high return on the capital that's deployed. And the excuse that, oh, well, we're just starting out is inadequate. And so it's a very difficult, I mean, I say, I say it with kind of this um, uh, you know, admiration, but it's really hard to implement. And, and I don't think you can allow the losses to mount too much uh, and still run a good, a good business. Do you think there's any sort of telltale signs that you've experienced that sort of differentiate the ones that are? No, I, I don't have a good, a, a good example. Um, uh, I do know that there are examples, though, where, where businesses that lack what I look for, which is that capacity to suffer, end up doing bad things. I'll give you an example. This is Cadbury, which is a confectionery company, um, was expanding into China. They had a strategy at first to be in the three big markets. And then they, um, they said, you know, look, we've got the capacity to invest and we have the capacity to suffer. And we're going to open up the next 200 markets, which in China might still be 2 million or more in population. And, and they said, so we're going to embark upon that process. And they went off and they started to spend behind the brand development and the market development more broadly in China. And then along came Nelson Peltz, who's an activist corporate raider. And he knocked on the CEO's door one day and said, I have 3%. Uh, not a bit happy. What can you do for me? The next week, um, that CEO announced that they were going to stop developing those 200 new markets in China. Um, it was some time into the development process, so I actually think they destroyed that present value. Because even though by stopping those 200 markets from receiving startup investment any longer, they will reduce near-term losses, they built goodwill, they built brand awareness, they, they begun the process of becoming a company in those, in those 200 cities. And with a stroke of the pen, he increased reported profits, giving the takeover guy something that he thought was useful. And probably destroyed that in the process. And so, um, you know, what I'm looking for is, is trying to find businesses that take the other side of that bet. But uh, it's very difficult. And, 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 and as I described it to you, it's overly simplistic. I'm trying to the company to say what talk to Well, thank you again. So we talked a lot about uh, the process which you use to value companies, especially undervalued company, value companies. I was wondering, on the flip side of that, have you recognized through your value process certain industries that are overvalued that perhaps the industry isn't aware of anything you know, like social media stuff and that's the obvious one? Like, are there any particular trends that you should be concerned about in order to avoid that next bubble like you did in the late 1990s? Gold. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I think gold might be, be that bubble. Um, we were talking about this, uh, Jeff and I were talking about this today. Um, you know, gold's the answer to every problem. If somebody were to say, God, I'm worried about political risk, you know, I, I'm worried about personal safety, buy gold. Uh, you can take it with you in, in the night, you can run with it. 
Um, you know, if they say, I worry about inflation, what should I do? Well, you know, buy gold. Um, um, some who are worried about deflation, Jeff said, um, have a mind towards buying gold. I mean, it's just one of those remarkable moments, and it gets there in part because all the answers that are given are given against the backdrop of something that's gone from 270 to 1600 in an almost unbroken march. And so, you know, they, they fabricated this in answer to any number of questions. Indeed, this is an answer to inflation, probably, maybe not from these prices. But it's also kind of glib because it's worked so well. And so, um, I, my money would say gold. Any other industries? I think the one about social networks is an interesting one. Um, I met uh, with um, companies recently that are all describing their involvement with Facebook. And uh, I must say that they're all signing up to use Facebook as a vehicle for advertising in, in unprecedented ways. And so um, it's going to come at an eye-popping price. But um, there seems to be this, this um, sense about, about the companies, whether it's Guinness or Heineken or Nestle, that if you access through fans in Facebook of brands, their friends, uh, which is an exploded multiple of the number of fans, that you have a better chance of recruiting among their friends through fans and then are the product users. So Guinness has half a million fans on Facebook. They have 83 million friends of fans. And um, Heineken has four and a half million fans on Facebook. Um, and Heineken's starting to spend a lot of money on Facebook. And um, and so it's pretty early days. The price will be, you know, eye popping, but but the possibility that that could deliver something significant is, is probably higher in my estimation than the possibility that gold can deliver something useful to your life. Okay. Yeah. Last question. Oh. Hi. I'm really interested to hear your opinion on this. Um, knowing that that um, you mentioned the college acquisition category, um, and knowing that they've now decided to demerge their business into two separate companies, um, their grocery business, which is supposed to be the slow growth, and then this high growth uh, snacks business, do you think that they'll be able to successfully grow this, the, the snacks business, knowing what you know about their culture, um, management, um, they're not really a first mover? Do you think that they'll be able to be successful? Yeah, I do. They have some great markets. Brazil's a great market, India's a great market. Cadbury was a colonial country in India. Is anyone here from India? Is, is Cadbury a brand that you're aware of in India? It is. It's, it's a fairly powerful presence, isn't it? Are, are there local competitors or is it? Uh, I think it's, it's a big name. It's kind of a category. So they've got, they've got some serious advantages that came through Cadbury and whether or not Craft it once it'll lift from those category advantages. We'll see. But for business, Cadbury's business alone, that's why we own it, is poised to grow. I don't know that wrapping Craft's business around it is going to make you grow better. I guess that was what my question yeah. was. Knowing David, what you know about the culture. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's, I don't know the answer to that. And, and, uh, um, they bought the known biscuit business in Europe. Uh, with the idea that they'd be able to saddle onto that all sorts of their other uh, US oriented cookie businesses like Oreos. And it really didn't have any lift whatsoever. And so their history should have suggested that it's hard for them to go more globally through a global partner on whose distribution route they think that they'd gain advantage. So their their own history hasn't been successful in that in that model once before. And we'll see. So, uh, out of time, um, I'd like to ask you a last question that I ask usually to everybody. Uh, what is the biggest lesson you learned in life and investing over the last 30 years? Um, <laughs> <laughs> two, five. <laughs> It's a, it's a tough question, really. Um, you know, most any answer just sounds very um, uh, uh, cliché. Um, you know, I, 
I guess the answer that I would say is the, um, the, the two words that I would ask each of you to keep um, always at the tip of your tongue whenever you're confronting anything in life is who says. So that's it. Make sure that you understand the uh, bias of people who say something to you um, when they say it. Um, when, when, you, when you listen to the uh, interpretations of history, when you listen to the offerings of Wall Street people asking you to take actions one way or another, just always think of the, um, the very serious possibility that what you're being told comes with, um, with a whole host of other uh, strings attached. And then you'll be better off asking that question um, because you won't take um, for granted, face things that can get you in trouble. That's basically it. Who says?